I'm going to start this morning's message, part six, of course, in our series, Finding Home in the Father's Heart. I'm going to start with this comment or this statement. If you knew who God created you to be, you would not want to be with someone else. Yeah. If you knew who God created you to be, you would not want to be someone else. Many times we try and be someone else. We try and, yeah, it's okay to be inspired by somebody. But God wants you to be the best version of you that you can be. Yeah. Talking about today, about the search for significance. One of the definitions of a father in the, in the dictionary is this. The person we get our significance from. Isn't that interesting? The person we get our significance from. But what happens if your, if your earthly father was not healed enough to, to speak significance into you? What if your dad left when you were young or, or you never even knew who he was? What if he could not be that for you? What happens to you then? Is it, oh, well, bad luck. You, you, you got the, the, you know, the worst part of the draw. You just need to deal. No, no, no. There is something available to us even when our earthly father did not rise up. Many people inside and out of the church wander through life wondering <laughs> who they are, trying to work out, um, is God out there? Does God even know me? Does he love me? Does he care? And because many have had an experience with an earthly father that did not show interest, that really did not care much, they think, well, obviously, that's how God sees me. And then this repeated pattern goes from generation to generation, and you have continual people behaving like orphans, totally unaware that there is a father who loves them, that there's a home to belong to. Yeah. And I say, why, why would I believe a God who, who I can't see, who I can't feel, why would I believe that he cares about little old me? I mean, does he even know where I live? <laughs> does he know where Melton is? I've got some good news for you. He does care. He is interested and he always will be. The truth of God's revelation about himself in scripture is so breathtaking to me because it shows a God who is so committed to people. I love um, Jesus' teachings many times about this, but there's an interesting one that we see in, in Matthew 10, 29 to 30, but we're going to look at it in the message paraphrase. Look at this. Jesus is teaching, what's the price of a pet canary? Wouldn't that get your attention? Canary. What has spirituality got to do with a canary? He goes on, what's the price? Well, some loose change, right? And God cares... What happens to it even more than you do? He pays even greater attention to you down to the last detail. And get this, even numbering the hairs on your head. For some of you, that is so easy. I'm seeing a couple of fellas right here. Actually, three of you. But for the rest of us with beautiful locks, it takes him more time. <laughs> but he cares. He cares so much for you. He's so in love with you that he cares about the hairs on your head. Yeah. Even that. You're so significant in the Father's eyes that he gave his most precious treasure to you to prove to you once and for all, you matter. You matter to me. Now, I can imagine the Father God screaming out into the, to, to anyone that would hear. I cannot imagine, imagine heaven without you. I don't want to have eternity without you. So I'll do whatever it takes to get to you. Romans 8.32 puts it beautifully. For God has proven, sorry, for God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son, Jesus. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. 
if he did not withhold Jesus, why is it that sometimes we're so quick to believe that he would withhold his love from us? That he would withhold his goodness, kindness, freedom, healing, wholeness, provision and protection. Many times we, we, mm, we speak of a God that is nothing like the God of the Bible. It's a different version. Why are we so quick to not only question his nature, but also tear down and tear apart what he loves most? Ourselves. Have you ever spoken of yourself in the third person? Be honest. Guess who you're coming into agreement with? The devil himself. He's got a lot to say about you and it's not good. Oh, Mark, you're such an idiot. Oh, Mark, you, you'd never get it. And it's speaking in the third person and the devil's saying, you're speaking my language. That's what he's saying in that accent too. You're speaking my language. And that's what we're doing sometimes. We're speaking the devil's lingo. By destroying what God loves most. Every one of us. King David wrote the majority of the Psalms. But I can imagine when he sat down to write what we know as Psalm 139, it would not have been just, oh yeah, yeah, pretty cool, good idea, good concept. He would have been writing it and would have had to stop because of the awe of what he was being revealed, what God was revealing to him. Look at this. I think it's verses yeah, 13 to 15. He's writing this to God. God, you formed my innermost being. Shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. That's breathtaking. As if God said, King David, come up and let me show you what I saw when you were being moulded together in your mother's womb. Before your mum saw you for the first time, God was watching you. In the womb, as you were being formed, as an ear was being shaped, the nose, the heartbeat started beating for the first time. I can imagine Father God saying, oh, that's beautiful. Wow. And each finger was being formed and your limbs and, and all these things that no one else saw but him. He was in awe of you. Just get, get that concept in your head for a moment. Everything about you means everything to him. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have included this in the scriptures. <laughs> he picked your hair color. The original. Some of you have actually forgotten what hair color is the original. <laughs> yeah. He actually chose the original color. Pretty amazing. He picked the color of your eyes. He decided how tall you would be. He decided the shape of your nose. That's how much he cared. That's how much he cares. So when you allow verses like this to, to really sink down where it matters most into the heart, you start to see yourself from a different set of eyes. You start to get his definition of your self-worth. You never doubt any longer how significant you actually are to him. The problem is, guys, listen, the problem is we listen to the wrong voices too easily. 
We're looking at the wrong things online. We're, we're listening to people's opinions. And let me, are there any people in your life that have an opinion about you? They've got an opinion about what you should do with your business, what you should do with your family, how you should raise your kids, what you should be shoving in your mouth, or how many hours you need to be exercising, on and on. And they've got an opinion. And if you focus on those opinions, you will lose yourself. You cannot be everything to everybody. Be free, dear church. Be free. Go to the one who made you. Go to the one who shaped you in your mother's womb, that gave you the personality that you have for a reason. That was my biggest struggle. I'm an introvert. This, what I'm doing right now, is very unnatural for me. And I would beat myself up because I was not an extrovert like many of the people around me. And I'd go on into pastors' gatherings and we would be in a network and you know, a room full of pastors. And I looked at them, I go, I don't fit here. I go, every single one of these guys are extroverts. And I think, God, you made a mistake. You made a, why did you call me to this? I'm happy to be behind the computer doing something that no one even sees. I'm happy with that, God. And when I had to come to terms with the fact that he makes no mistakes, And his calling is his calling, not mine. And I just had to say yes. I had to come to terms and be okay with the personality that he gave me. I'm not like others. You're not like others. Embrace the you that he loves. Come on, church. Embrace the you that he loves. Out of billions of people in the world, there's only one version of you. Don't try and be like someone else, please. Social media has created a reality for people that has destroyed this aspect so deeply. A survey done last year gave some terrifying results of people aged between 16 and 24, the the damage that social media has done. Listen to some of this. It's quite shocking. Out of a 1,000 people surveyed, 96% said that they are deeply and negatively affected emotionally because they continually compare themselves to others on social media. 92% said that they're experiencing negative consequences because of this comparison. They have admitted to severe depression, self-harm and self-hatred, some even suicidal. 86% so that they feel pressured to live up to some kind of version of perfection that the fake people online are portraying. It's all fake. 89% said that they are completely unsatisfied with the life that they now live. This is reality. This is what the young people are going through. Other other consequences, this survey says, are people battling feelings of jealousy, envy, feeling uninspired, hopeless, heartbroken, unhappy, and angry. Why? Because we're a culture of people looking for value, looking for significance in all of the wrong places. The old devil is so cunning. He's doing this really, really well. I don't want to give him credit, but he's doing a good job at this. Where this little screen that we hold in our hands is shaping me, is shaping you. We're going to be, we have to really be wise in how much we allow that to happen. Everyone is searching for significance. So when I say significance, this is what I actually mean. It is the quality of being worthy of attention and being someone of importance. Understanding that God says you are someone that matters. You are someone that matters. It's God speaking into the inner craving that we all desire. I just want this life to mean something. I just want my life and what I can contribute and who I am to be accepted. Ah, oh, No wonder this is coming under such great attack. God is saying, listen. You're not a mistake. Maybe you shocked your parents, <laughs> but you didn't shock me. 
Another couple of verses in Psalm 139 go like this. Every single moment, David writes, you are thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. Whoa. When I wake each morning, you're still with me. Try and count the grains of sand. Now come to talk here this afternoon. Give it a go. 20 years later, you'd still be trying. And King David is saying, God, look, on every, the, the grains of sand on every shore, they are like your thoughts toward me. Oh, come on. This, this, this would have been huge for him. See, God knows you intimately. God is so completely in awe of the creation that he poured into you. That he's shouting to you, you're my cherished child. You're the desire of my heart. You are significant. I made sure that you would be born. It's not a mistake. It's not an error. I hold my little grandson Carter all the time, and I know he wasn't intended by Chanel. I know it was a bit of a whoops. I get that, but not in God's eyes. I thank God every day for him. I don't see him as a mistake. He's a gift. Let me assure you, if God didn't care, you'd know it. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you ever, ever question your value, if you ever question your significance, may these couple of images be burned into your memory. You ready? Look at this. If you ever question your value, remember the cross. That's God telling you, this is how much I love you. This is how much I love you. Why do you question it? Why do you doubt your value? Why do you doubt your significance? Look what I did. You mean the world to me. And the reason so many question this is that we believe the lie that Father God's love is like human love. (laughs) Oh, thank God it's not. We believe the lie that God is easily offended, easy to disappoint, and that he's quick to give up on us because we just cannot get it right. (laughs) Have any of you been beaten? Have any, have any of you beaten yourself up because you're doing well for a season and then, oh, I fell, fell again. Oh, I'm so, oh, today I'm more than a conqueror. Tomorrow, oh, whoa, he's me. Yeah, have you, have anybody, am I telling anyone's story? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, one day you feel so close, you can hear the heartbeat. We sang about it, I'm hearing your heartbeat. And the next moment something goes wrong, say, God, where are you? Have you deserted me? It's crazy. H- have I What? Have you deserted me? Do you remember me? Do you love me? You're kidding me, aren't you? (laughs) What language are you speaking? Who are you agreeing with? Paul's revelation of this was awesome in Romans 8.39. He says, absolutely nothing. How much? Absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Absolutely nothing. No opinion, no circumstance, no emotion or feeling, no thought, no belief system can get in the way of his love for you. How good is that? Are you awake? That's good news. You should be like shouting and jumping on the chairs and hanging off the rafters. Are they rafters? Oh, yeah. I'll give you a boost. This should, this should excite us. Because I'm not talking about what goes on here. I'm talking now about here. The heart of who you are. God is going after your heart because he knows when your heart is transformed and you've taken it beyond a understanding of who he is and now it becomes personal, that's when things start to change. A mental understanding of God can only take you so far. 
Okay. I want to show you a particular verse. And hang in there with me. I'm not going to be much longer. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says this. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Okay. The original language that this was written in was an ancient Greek that we really don't have access to these days. But the, the original Greek for the word no is the Greek word ginosko or ginosko. Now, this means to know by having a mental understanding of the truth. It's here. Okay? It's you saying, yep, I know this to be true. You've got a number of verses in the Bible which you ginosko, you know them. You know them mentally. Yep, yep, I agree with it. Yep, I know it to be true. That That's a mental agreement with the truth. But that's not all that's taking place here. He says, what does it say? We have come to know and what? And have believed. Knowing and believing are two different things. The word believe here is the Greek word pisteo. You impressed by that? Pisteo, which means to put faith in. To put faith in. It's a heart thing. It's not just a head thing. <laughs> it's going deeper. You're saying, not only do I know this to be true, but this truth has so transformed my heart that I'm living as if it's true. There are millions of people around the world who know God exists, but their lives don't show evidence of it. You still with me or have I offended you? There are millions of people around the world who know God is true and that he exists, but their lives show no fruit of that, of that knowledge. It only happens when the, that, that, that ginosko, that knowing becomes a belief because it's hit here and now the fruit of your heart and your decisions and your faith start to show evidence. Is that is that is that correct? Yeah. You start to trust God when everything around you seems to be falling apart. You never question your value because you know what he says about you. It's not just a knowledge, it's a belief. In the academy this past week, I actually touched on this subject and, and I, I gave a quote from Bill Johnson. He said something like this. Every day I have coming across my sim symbolic desk a request from the enemy trying to tell me who I am. And I stamp, request denied. Because he says, I choose to believe what God says about me, not what the devil's trying to tell me. You have to make a choice. Request denied, devil, sorry. Devil, I'm not going to enter a conversation with you. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. Believing is different from knowing. One is in the head, the other is in the heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. Have you ever noticed when you read something in the Bible and, and the insight would, you know, your brain receives it, you chew on it for a while, you think it through, it might take a few days of doing that, sometimes even weeks, because it's, 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 it's really captured your attention. But only when it drops, for, they say about 18 inches from here to here, only when it drops those 18 inches, you think, ah, yes, now I can live it. Now I can live it. It's a good, important process to go through. But sadly for many, God's truth in his scripture, God's truth as revealed from him to you, gets stuck in the head <laughs> and it never flows to the heart where real change takes place. I find people that, that love to discuss and debate and argue over theology. What's theology? Theology is the study of God. Theologians are a unique breed among themselves. I used to mix with them and it did my head in. 
Because all we were discussing and debating was this. We had opinions of God. We thought we could work God out. We started asking questions that questioned who God was because he didn't fit our particular box. My Bible college professor once said to me, he goes, Mark, I had to walk out of my theology class because we were asking questions about who we thought God was and it almost destroyed my faith. I almost walked away from following Jesus because of theology. Theology is good, but it has to lead to the heart. Your knowledge of God is not enough. It has to become a belief. A belief that changes the very fabric of who you are. Is that cool? AJ Jones, who wrote, who wrote the book Finding Father, she said this, only when that information takes up residence in your heart and becomes revelation that you will begin to live like it is true. Only then. So when John 4.16 says this, we have come to know and have believed what? Love. You know it and you believe it. And when you start to hear what he thinks of you, it is breathtaking. It is breathtaking. That word love, I'll give you one guess what the Greek word for that one is. Any agape. I love agape love because agape love is the love that flows from the father's heart directly to his significant one, you. Agape love is only found in the Christian life. There is no version of agape love in the world today. It does not exist because it comes directly from Father God to you. Now, how many of you would you agree that you are in a process of understanding this? You're in the process of understanding. Oh, look, I'll be honest. I still have moments where I think more like an orphan than a son. I still have moments where I don't feel loved. I don't feel wanted. I don't feel significant. I don't feel like I'm worthy, but my feelings can get in the way of faith. Because if I depend on my emotion of what I feel like on the day, God is schizophrenic. Now, seriously, if I'm depending on my emotions, God is schizophrenic. Because one, one day he's this, the other day he's that. He doesn't even know who he is. Don't put that on God. <laughs> Sometimes I still battle thoughts that I'm not good enough. I'm not able to do what God has called me to do. I'm sure you would agree. This process can be brutal sometimes. But God is working on each of us to move head knowledge into the heart. So be encouraged, dear family. Be encouraged. He's moving you forward. He is waking you up. He is walking with you every single day of your life, telling you, reminding you how much value is in you, how significant, how much you are needed and how much you are wanted, that you are fully loved and that you are wholly accepted. Imagine your insecurities melting away in the face of such love. Can you imagine? Imagine all fear of the future falling away. Because you know your amazing father has got the plans worked out. For I know the plans I have for you. What is it? Jeremiah 29. 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to do what? Prosper you and give you a great future. Fill you with hope. Imagine being able to love others well because you, you're, you are a recipient of his amazing love. Because you can only give from what you've received. Yeah. Imagine knowing that you are so special to God, so significant and chosen that you don't want to be anyone else. Yeah. Oh. Imagine being so free, so healed, so alive that no one can steal this away from you. Yeah. When you see signs like that beginning to happen in your life, you are starting to see a great movement happen from here to here. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. When you live like you're loved by God, 
you are the best version of yourself that you ever can be. Hallelujah. God's opinion on people is the answer to humanity's crisis right now. Social media is with us. We can't avoid it. But there's a solution. Check. Yeah, you might have to not go there. You're right. If that's what you need to do, do it. But we have to continually go back to his opinion. Father, what are you saying about me today? <sighs> Father, I don't, I don't feel like I'm worth anything today. I'm having a hard time. God, what do you say? Stop long enough to ask the question. Don't just settle for a lie, please. Everything you will ever need to know and believe is in him. Save yourself a lot of wasted time, heartache and confusion and doubts. Go to the one who formed you in your mother's womb, who chose you, who shaped you, who molded you to the one that he wanted you to be. Go to him. Go to him. I'm going to close with what I just was sitting down preparing this week's message. And I believe God wanted me to write this down for you to read. And then I'm going to close with a video and then we're done. I really hope this encourages you. This is what I believe Father God is saying. This is a Rima now word from him to you. So I no, was... sorry, not yet, Heidi. This one. I am pursuing you with love. I want you to be with me. I want you in my family. I will do whatever it takes to reach you and show you that nothing can separate you from my love. Yeah. Never, ever doubt your worth to me. Never, ever doubt your value to me. Never, ever question my love for you. Your search for meaning, significance and purpose ends with me. You are here today because he went after you. Yeah. You're breathing today because he has a purpose for you. Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious to Drew by now that God's got him. <laughs> he should not have walked away from that accident. Shouldn't have walked away. But he did. God cares about what we consider the least of these. God cares about the ones that even we in the church today try to stay away from. Watch this video and then I'll end it. So I, would, I, was, I got blessed with a massage and I was super excited. I'm going to get a massage and I'm super excited. And I go in Laguna Beach where I grew up and I go in very excited that I, I am going to have this massage. And I'm really stoked about it. I'm really happy. And I walk in, and right on the wall, this big sign says, Reiki Healer. I'm like, crud. I need to leave. I don't want that person laying hands on me. And then Lord, very, very clearly, with a chuckle, <laughs> said, why don't you ask me? So I said, well, why would I have to? And I'm having this dialogue, like the woman at the well, having a dialogue. God's dialoguing back. Hi, I mean, really, God? Seriously, you wouldn't want that Reiki healer to put their hands on me. I'm going to go share the gospel somewhere. And what if it's jumping around, you know? I mean, I don't know. I just need to leave. And he said again, did you ask me? And I said, okay, okay. I couldn't know the answer if you asked me the question. Do you want me to stay? He said, yes. So uh, <laughs> if this bugs you, it's just me. Just, just explain the fact we're all just unique. So this is me. This doesn't have to be you. Please don't try to be somebody else. Wear your own shoes. Walk in your own anointing. Don't try to be somebody else, the next so-and-so. Just be you fully filled with God. That's it. Nobody, ah, don't try to copy. Copies are worthless. So I was out there, and I'm just like doing the warfare thing. I'm doing a dance in the, in the massage place. I've got my robe on, and I've got my dance on. I'm like, 
I just found every spirit of darkness and uh, every reiki spirit. And I'm like, and then I put my face on the, on the, down there. And I'm laying out there under a towel. Too much information. And I'm, I'm laying there and I'm just praying quietly in tongues now. I don't want to scare her. And she walks in the door. She walks in the door and she went, Wah! I said, she said, well, she said first, she said, there's light, light everywhere. There's light everywhere. I said, oh, honey, that's Holy Spirit. That's Holy Spirit. So she tries to lay her hands on me to try to do a massage and I can't feel any hands, just hot, liquid, drip, drip, drip. She's sobbing. Presence of God fell on her. She started sharing her life story. She can't do any massage. She's incapable. She's undone. She, she was a, an a agnostic that went into Reiki with the background from who knows where. But anyway, after an hour, she, she just, <laughs> she told me her whole story. I never got a massage, but she welcomed Jesus. <laughs> God loved that Reiki healer so much that he sent Heidi. Reiki healer, you serious? New age, dark, demonic forces. And what if Heidi was adamant that day? No, I'm not going in there. I can't be in that place of influence. I cannot allow that to influence me. If that happened, that day she would not have become a daughter of God. If God pursues someone so purposefully, and goes after them with such love. What makes you think that he doesn't continue to do that for you? Come on. Come on. You're his family. You belong to him. You have his name. Lord God. Sometimes a, a mere thank you for your love, it's just not enough. <sighs> Father, please help us to understand the significance, the value of who we are in your eyes. Please, God, God help us to see what you see. Help us to celebrate what you celebrate. Help us to live up to the people that you have created us to be. Break from us, God, any, anything that wants us to try and be someone else. Yes. Break off us, Lord God, the lies that we believe perhaps about how, how worthless we are, how hopeless we are, how good for nothing we are. God, break those words off us now once and for all in the name of Jesus. And God, give us a supernatural protection over our ears and our hearts that when people do decide to give an opinion, it's like water off a duck's back. It does not sink in. Hallelujah. God, we want to honor you with being the people that live up to the version that you decided, the version that you created, the version that you molded in our mother's womb. God, we want to honor you as an act of worship to be who you want us to be. I seal this now and I ask this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Guys, look, this week for you, you might think it's going to look one way. Don't be shocked if you start hearing him speak of you in another way. Because I believe as I pray for you and I believe as we apply what we've, what we've heard today that you're going to hear God speak things in a dream in your prayer, in your interaction with him, that might, like, that might sound like he's speaking about somebody else. He's actually talking about you. I declare over you that your destiny and your dreams are coming alive because now you're starting to realize you're here for a reason. 
You're not here to take up space. You're not here to fill the seat in which you sit. It's, thank God for seats, but don't make that your home. You're needed. Oh, dear one, you are needed. You are wanted. You are necessary. We've got a mission. We've got an assignment from him. I don't know when Jesus is going to come back, but he will be. I don't know how much time we have left, but I don't think it's that much. How about we make it count? How about we be the best version of us that we can be in Jesus' name and live up to what Father says of us? Come on, church. We can do this. I love you guys so much, but he loves you more. (laughs) Amen. Have an amazing day, an amazing week ahead, and we look forward to catching up very soon. Amen.